Professor Huang keynote will provide us with a comprehensive understanding of his topic. Please join me in welcoming Professor Josh Huang to the stage for his keynote address. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I'm probably the last technical speaker, so I would like to thank the organizer for organizing this very enjoyable and a successful conference. Thank you. <clears throat> right, uh, we know computers has a very high performance. Okay, uh, the reason is computers has a computer clock. The clock ticks one million times or one billion times per second. Okay, uh, so my talk or my research, this particular research is trying to introduce the computer CPU architecture, the algorithm, into uh, the smart uh, uh, factory or industry 4.0 uh, uh, smart factory, okay? And the title here, Trilogy of Innovation. So I will explain three uh, major innovations so that we can incorporate uh, the CPU algorithms into smart factory. Okay, so um, actually it, the project uh, we are doing is to develop a smart factory computer. So in the future, the factory will work like a computer. Let's see how uh, we are trying to do. Now, a lot of people have been talking about uh, Industry 4.0 so far, everywhere, including this conference, okay? Um, and majority of the talks are about the 12 enabling technologies listed on the right-hand side, okay? Um, not all, all of them are necessary. Even if a company implemented all of them, it's not sufficient because they are multidisciplinary, not transdisciplinary. So, this conference is about transdisciplinary. So it's the natural organic integration of multiple disciplines so that the integration uh, performance much better than any, the sum of all, any all, all of these disciplines, okay? <clears throat> now, one, uh, the previous session, uh, Professor Joe mentioned we do not have consensus about industry 4.0, but we do have one consensus. Industry 4.0 is a revolution. Now, the question here is, if it is a revolution, if the revolution is successful, things must be different, okay? At least one thing must be different, different from what we have learned from textbooks. So I spent 15 years looking for one thing that could be different, and I'm happy to report to what I have uh, found so far, okay? Um, for example, like, do we still use those stochastic decision models for production planning, scheduling, execution? When, if we have industry 4.0, okay, that's the question. So let's uh, move on. I did try to uh, search the literature uh, how Industry 4.0 influence uh, the operations management. I find three literature review papers, and when I read uh, them, actually they end up talking about the 12 ena enabling technologies on the right, okay, basically. Um, instead of talking about what should be new in operations management. Okay, so at the, uh, University of Hong Kong and my team has started um, working on Industry 4.0 Smart Factory. This was the first smart lab-based smart factory we developed and demonstrated at Hong Kong Exhibition Center. We, we call it Autumn. That was the first generation we produced in 2009. Uh, ever since that, we uh, upgraded into Rupture, which is basically an MES system, okay, but incorporated the real-time uh, data and uh, traceability transparency. 
And recently, we have upgraded the rupture uh, into what we originally called graduation ceremony manufacturing system. Uh, one day, I sat on the stage attending <coughs> Hong Kong University graduation system, and I got the inspiration that we uh, actually that's what we need for industry 4.0, and then we incorporated that procedure algorithm into manufacturing. But we did not have the scientific foundation for this method. We know it works, but there's no science behind it. So I have keep talking to other professors. And my dean, ex-dean, gave me the answer, because that's exactly how the CPU works. OK. So eventually, we identified the scientific foundation for our research. Now, this is a project we just got from government, Hong Kong government. It's about a million, a million uh, euro project uh, for three years. Uh, it's a co collaboration between several universities. I just moved from Hong Kong University to Polytechnic University uh, last December. <clears throat> now, uh, our vision is at the center. We try to develop a factory computer for uh, uh, planning, scheduling, and executing operations like a high performance computer. That's our vision. Now we have uh, uh, three uh, pillars of innovation here, and we have some breakthrough or expected breakthroughs uh, at uh, the lower left. So I will go through one by one. Now, first pillar of innovation is uh, uh, digitization, factory digitization. Now, digitization, we have been talking about digitization all the time. But digitization is an art. It's not a science. If you ask company ask me to do digitization, ask you to do digitization, the approaches will be completely different, and the results will be completely different. No standards. Nobody agrees with each other. Okay, So uh, that's not good. That is not good. So we uh, try to propose uh, an architecture, which is computer architecture, for digitizing the factory. Just follow the computer architecture, because we have spent at least 50 years studying uh, computer architecture. It's mature. Uh, it works very fast, robust. Okay, so. Uh, what we can do is, it doesn't matter how you, what sensor you use, how you do digitization. Eventually, you have to create a computer memory because sensor collect data and send the data to the system. Okay, just like, you know, the computer memory, you keep everything in the computer memory and the registers. Okay, so the. Outcome must be a computer architecture, computer memory. That's it. Okay. It doesn't matter how you do it. Make sure it forms a computer memory for the digitization. <coughs> and a lot of people talk about the physical objects, and then we use sensors and communication protocols to produce digital twins. So we have the cyberspace, physical space, and then we have cyber uh, physical synchronizations okay, uh, enabled by this uh, cyber physical thread, which we have discussed yesterday's uh, uh, workshop. Okay. Now, uh, everybody follows more or less similar architecture like this. Okay. So I'm not going to get into detail. Now, there are some basic questions, for example, to what extent, what shall we di uh, digitize? The granularity. So based on our industrial uh, projects, we identified one principle, which is the unit that create value, then you digitize it. If the unit does not create the most value, don't digitize it, because the cost uh, 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 return on investment is not justified. And for industrial engineers, we know how to identify the 
value creation unit. Okay, we have method for doing that. All right, so for example, like this, we can uh, decompose the factory into assembly line. So each line is a value creation unit so that we can treat each line as a factory computer to develop the computer and then digitize uh, its element. And also we have a fixed position uh, workstations like this. Okay, so more or less all the factory, discrete manufacturing factories can be decomposed into these lines, stations, okay? So we basically uh, use one computer for each station or one line, okay, to develop. And here, uh, on the left-hand side, that's the architecture of a computer, uh, okay, typical architecture. So this is the CPU, and then we have input-output, this memory. Okay, this is how we digitize uh, the factory, its assembly line. So we use digital twin to create the memory, computer memory, okay? And then we convert the uh, MES system, uh, manufacturing section systems, in this place, okay? Um, it's possible, we can do it, all right? So that's the analogy between computer architecture and the uh, smart uh, uh, assembly line. So that's the first pillar of innovation. It, it takes half days to talk about it. Okay? Digitization is the fund foundation we have to do. Okay? But as I said, the outcome of digitization is to create a computer memory. That's it. Okay, uh, follow that standard. It doesn't matter how you do it, just do it that way, uh, so that we can develop the factory computer. Now the uh, second pillar of innovation is the uh, smart factory operating system. So if we have a, a computer, a factory computer, then we need an operating system to manage all the memories, sensors, and decisions executed decisions as well, including production planning, scheduling, execution, okay? Now, uh, if we look at how the CPU works, uh, CPU basically is a factory, okay, processing data, that's it. And it also plan, schedule, and execute the instructions, basically the same as factory. So, uh, the a CPU has one algorithm, which is called out of order, OOE, uh, which was a revolution in 70s. OOE, because of OOE in 70s, our computer works with high performance. Without OOE algorithm, computer's performance would not be high. Okay, so we try to introduce the OOE algorithm into smart factory uh, 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 logics. Okay, so for those of you who are interested, you can check what does OOE mean. Okay, that's basically in 70s, early 70s, late 60s invention. Okay, now that's one. Another one, uh, uh, very important feature, the CPU does its job is to, the uh, CPU lock, locks around in its memory so that decide what should be done best now at this moment. Okay, so the, the, the CPU the clock clicks. Each click, it will lock around and then decide what should you do next. So that's what we call it, uh, locks around. So in smart uh, industry 4.0 smart factory, we collect data already. So we can also lock around using the real-time visibility and the traceability. So incorporate that into the smart factory decision. And the middle one is multitasking synchronization. Um, we, for those who are interested in computers or CPU, it also mentioned the, the multitasking. Manufacturing basically factories, assembly lines are 
typically multitasking. So if we involve multitasking, then we need to synchronize the multiple uh, tasks. Okay, so these are the three key uh, components we need to incorporate into smart factory operating systems. Okay. We did the small scale gateway operating systems. Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Xu is here in his uh, PhD study. Uh, so we expand the gateway operating system into factory operating system. Okay, so that's the um, um, second pillar of uh, um, innovation. Now, the CPU clocks for factory we actually have more than uh, one clock because we, have, we call them a beat, heartbeat. Say so one heartbeat is how frequent the sensor should collect data. Okay, the, the more often you want to collect data, the higher the price you have to pay for the sensor. Okay, that's a decision. And, and another clock is how often you make a decision, okay? These two beats, decision beat and sensor beats are different. Uh, sensor beat, uh, uh, if you sensor beat too fast and decision say you, uh, sensor beat one minute and decision 10 minutes, then you are wasting your energy beating too fast because I only make a decision 10 minutes cycle. So I basically, the heartbeat, sensor beat only need to be once per 10 minutes, okay? So that's one. Uh, uh, there's another beat, is the beat of health. So the factory is health, healthy. So it has a, a beat. Uh, 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 so the sensor should beat uh, not too far, faster than the health beat, okay? Again, if beat too fast, it wouldn't help your health anyway, okay, because it costs uh, uh, too much. So then we have the uh, scheduling horizon and the planning horizon. In production, planning horizon is usually a month or half year or one year. Uh, scheduling horizon is like a day or a week. Uh, execution is much smaller, uh, half day or one hour. And decision here, we are developing is like five minutes or 10 minutes. Okay, the heartbeat can be one minute. All right, so these. Now, this is very important because for computer CPU, for each clock tick, it will does its job. If there's no job, it does nothing. Okay, just waste of time. Because it clicks so fast, it doesn't matter if you waste a few uh, 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 you know, uh, text. That's it. Okay, that's okay. Now, in uh, production management, professors have been developing, you know, stochastic decision systems. Okay, and computer CPUs do not deal with uncertainty. It only does what it knows, look around and it decide to move. Okay, so we actually incorporated this uh, into the smart factory operation measurement system, you can know all the uncertainty. Okay, within this small beat, the period. Okay, but tr treat uncertainty in a larger time horizon. Okay, so if we do not know anything, we slice the time, space, and the time. Slice it to a degree that everything is certain. So the CPU will execute that with certainty, okay? Leave uncertainty for the next cycle, okay? This is a very important uh, 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 concept. For the moment, nobody agrees with me uh, uh, so far, okay? Uh, especially industrialists. Uh, I find it's very difficult to persuade them because this is completely different from how we uh, have been working and how we have been trained in universities and research studentships, okay? But it works because uh, we did some uh, uh, industrial projects and it works, it never goes wrong, okay? Because 
uh, we consider uncertainty, but later, not now. Okay. And we also, you know, uh, 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 divide the value creation unit as a computer, and then we uh, define the boundaries between digital twins and also the CPUs. Uh, that's very, very important because digital twins are self-centered uh, intelligent units. Okay, it executes, manages itself. However, we have to define the boundaries very clearly so that they can work together to, uh, to achieve the common objective. Okay, so we define the boundaries. Boundaries are basically something like this. Okay, uh, to, to the continuity, some principles in finite element method, some principles, not exactly the same, but principles are like that, your boundary conditions you set up then the digital twins are able to collaborate uh, according to the boundary conditions we set. Okay. Now that's the uh, brief uh, introduction of the second pillar of innovation. The third one actually is uh, the typical scenario we identified for uh, this uh, factory computer. The first one was uh, IMSE Studio was a 3D printing uh, platform we developed at Hong Kong U, now at Poly U, uh, basically 3D printers, and then we have the controllers, and we have digital uh, blockchains to manage its uh, orders for printing. Okay, it's a teaching platform, but we use that as uh, our first uh, test bed to develop the factory computer, because uh, we have the direct access, or we actually developed its control algorithm. So we can easily uh, uh, manage its control algorithm into the factory uh, operating system. The second one is a hybrid flow shop. Now this is a typical uh, manufacturing system for producing parts, okay, uh, uh, car parts or aerospace components. Usually use this one. This is smart assembly workstations. Now this is typically for uh, assembly uh, the airplanes, uh, buses, because the production volume is low. Uh, they are big, heavy, so they don't move. Products don't move. Instead, the man machine material moves to the station, so they are fixed position assembly island. Uh, this is, sorry, this is a fixed position uh, assembly island. This is a, a smart uh, workstation, assembly station, typically uh, assembly line consists of uh, uh, a number of uh, smart uh, assembly stations. We actually are developing some mobile stations to avoid uh, line balancing problem. In assembly line, you always have a line balancing problem. So we uh, uh, develop uh, mobile workstations so that we do not have this uh, a line balancing problem, okay? So these are the uh, four uh, scenarios we are uh, developing the factory computer, okay? Now this is uh, 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 the smart workstation we developed. So this is the assembly table, then the raw materials are here. So if you scan the uh, order, assembly order, then the material you need for this operation will come up to uh, where you need, you can reach. Okay, so the operator pick up the components and assemble them. So um, all these will be uh, managed by the AGVs, robotics, robots. Okay, so we were, uh, after we develop the uh, 3D printing platform, we will do this because we developed it including hardware uh, software, okay. And the next one is a smart construction. Smart construction is basically uh, just like an airplane assembly. It's a fixed position assembly, typical, okay. And in Hong Kong, this is a big industry. It's very easy to get research grants in construction, so this is why uh, mechanical engineer goes to uh, construction 
uh, area. And we have uh, been conducting uh, several major projects in Hong Kong with the constructions. Basically the same thing, okay, uh, fixed the position assembly. This is Hong Kong University main building. So we uh, 3D print the modules and use robots to construct them. Again, we can use, you know, uh, develop a factory computer for this scenario uh, in the context of smart construction. Now, I will talk about a few breakthroughs. There's some of the breakthroughs we uh, think we have achieved so far. The first one is uh, now, uh, the four breakthroughs are actually uh, reported on in four papers. So these are the details of the four papers. The first paper we wrote only had one word in the title, meta inventory. Okay, so you can guess uh, what does it mean. I will explain what does it mean later. The second one is zero warehousing manufacturing. Different from zero inventory manufacturing. Inventory, we must have inventory. We must have inventory. But inventory don't have to be maintained in warehouse. Okay, I will explain why that's the situation. Okay. The third one is a synchronized manufacturing. And again, this is a very typical uh, performance issue in industry. Um, machines work with high performance, but machines wait for each other for too long time. I will explain that later on. Okay. The last one is a graduation inspired uh, intelligent manufacturing system as a whole to achieve, to implement smart factory. Now the first one, the metal inventory. Uh, uh, yesterday we talked about uh, uh, digital twins. Okay, now digital twins are something that do not exist. Uh, you, we develop a, a, a digital twin from physical objects, but we can develop uh, digital twins without a physical object. Instead, we create physical objects according to what is in digital twin. Okay, so now we have a library of digital twin. Now we use digital twin as inventory. The, the, the advantage of using digital twin as a, a inventory is we do not need any space to keep inventory. Okay, we do not need warehouses or small warehouses to keep a small amount of physical. We still need a physical inventory, okay? But we don't need it, uh, uh, as much as in the past. We just keep the digital twin as inventory. Now, digital twin is different from, uh, you know, if we need uh, 12 bottles of beer, six in the fridge, in our fridge, six in the shop, that's different, okay? The six uh, bottles of beer in the shop are not, digital, uh, are not digital twins. They are physical products. They still incur inventory holding cost, okay? So that six bottles are, do not exist in the physical world yet. But whenever you need those six bottles, the smart factory can produce them and smart logistics can deliver them to where they are needed. Okay, that's the idea. If the industry 4.0 works that fantastic, then we should be able to do this. Okay, so that's the uh, idea. So um, we did some mathematical uh, uh, modeling and analysis. It does demonstrate uh, some advantages. Uh, we used the uh, uh, EOQ model, that's the basic, basic uh, textbook model. And we also used uh, this uh, EPQ analysis to analyze digital twin uh, inventory, okay? Um, but basically, as I said here, uh, we have the assembly line or assembly center, then we have the components to be assembled. So some components can be kept as a physical inventory, and some components can be kept as digital inventory. So for those components, we do not incur any inventory holding cost. 
we do not need a warehouse or space to keep them. But for these, we need. Okay, so that's the uh, advantage of using uh, digital twin, and that's also one power of digital twin we have not so far exploited by industry. And we hope through this conference we start our enthusiastic research into this, and companies are adopting this technology in the near, very near future. Okay. Uh, that's the first uh, 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 meta inventory uh, breakthrough we have been researching. Now the second breakthrough we now I, well, I will skip all those uh, models. They are uh, too detailed for discussion, too specialized. Okay. Now the second is uh, zero warehousing manufacturing. Uh, we have been, you know, just in time manufacturing production, uh, GIT uh, promotes uh, zero inventory manufacturing, which is absolutely not possible because we have to have inventory. Uh, uh, even squirrels has inventory. They hide nuts under snow or so under uh, uh, for for some other time to. Uh, eat, okay, so we have to have certain amount of uh, inventory. Uh, but inventory is, as I said early on, we don't have to keep inventory in warehouses. I will show you why do we uh, do not keep our inventory in warehouse. Why, what's the advantage? Okay, warehouse, uh, this is a typical configuration of factory, everybody knows, okay, the production line, then uh, we have a line side buffer, and then we have a warehouse somewhere else, or either in the factory or outside the factory. Then we have intro logistics for moving uh, materials from warehouse to buffers. Okay, that's a typical configuration. Now, what I'm saying is we do not need to have this part, this part. Okay, um, we still need this part. This is a just-in-time production. You know, I visited a number of uh, just-in-time manufacturing factories. Actually, they have inventories, a lot of inventories. Not in the assembly line, but up, upstream uh, enterprises, okay? They have inventories uh, in the supply chain, and the level of inventory is not lower than ordinary manufacturing system. If, if you don't believe, just you know, visit some of the companies. Now, if we look at the warehousing cost in a factory, 50% uh, are basically for the uh, um, order, order picking, order picking costs yellow. And then this gray is a storage, and uh, orange color receiving and shipping. Now, receiving and shipping cost we cannot eliminate. But fortunately, they only account for 30% of the cost. A storage and order picking, order picking accounts for 50% of the warehousing cost. Okay. And if we eliminate 50% and 20%, that's 70% of warehousing costs, then we save, we save 70% of the warehousing cost. Okay. That's enormous. Uh, the idea came from a, a company visit. The company makes air conditioning, air conditioner, and they want to do industry 4.0. The board of directors decided to implement robotics and auto automation in warehouses. And then I visited the warehouses. I find the warehouses are full of products, finished products. And you cannot in improve the efficiency because it's not the efficiency keep the product in the warehouse. It's the actual uh, order dispatching, the speed, okay, the management side. Nothing to do with the warehouse operation. So I told the vice president, you don't need to invest in anything. You just keep it like this. Instead, you use the lead time hedging. That's a separate story. Lead time hedging problem. Lead time hedging is the sales manager uh, take the customer order 
uh, when they place the production order, they always keep one week ahead of the actual uh, delivery date, okay? That's it. The company basically having like two weeks to three weeks of uh, lead time, one week lead time hedging. So if you reduce a lead time hedging from 14 days to seven days, then the company can reduce uh, the, the uh, warehousing time six, uh, for the moment 16 days to nine days. So that's exactly one week uh, their target. So I said you only need to talk to you uh, a production manager and a sales manager to reduce the uh, lead time hedging problem. You don't need to do automation robotics at all. Okay, and I found out the company has a quarter million square meters uh, finished product warehouse. That's enormous. That space is, is much larger than its assembly line, much larger than assembly line for finished product warehouses. So the cost uh, should be extremely high. So then we, you know, think about the zero uh, uh, warehousing manufacturing concept. And we did some simulation and also smart solutions for these. This is how the company, uh, you know, keep them in the finished uh, product warehousing, okay? So what we do, we eliminate these two parts. Uh, we don't keep uh, products in the warehouse, don't enter the warehouse, okay? Instead, we just uh, uh, dispatch to customer immediately when the products pro are produced. And we visit to the Dell uh, assembly line in China, and it, it works that way, okay? So the fast delivery company actually pick up the Dell computers immediately from assembly line and they dispatch them to us. Uh, to us. This is what we should do without any finished product uh, warehouses. And this is how we keep the uh, cost low and also lead time very short, very competitive. Okay, so uh, we can keep uh, inventories in these loading, unloading trucks or even the delivery trucks. Uh, the reason is in Industry 4.0, we know exactly how much in the truck and where the truck is. So if we know where they are, how much, then we are count them as inventory. If we do not know them, then they cannot be counted as inventory. That's if we you know, identify the definition of inventory is you know what we have. And that's inventory. If we do not know, then they are not inventory. So under industry 4.0, in theory, okay, uh, we know everything. So everything can be counted as inventory. Uh, anywhere, uh, on the truck, on, on the road, loading, unloading, okay. So and that amount of inventory are enough for us to hedge the risks we are facing. Okay, we don't need much inventory to hedge the risks. Okay, we need some amount. Okay, so but uh, again, in order to achieve zero uh, warehousing manufacturing, we need unitization, and we also need smart uh, synchronization. But uh, again, I wouldn't have time to. Uh, present in detail what we mean by unitization and synchronization, okay? Uh, but most successful manufacturing companies are already using a unitization and a synchronization uh, concept, okay? They have a trolley, so they have boxes, standardized the trolley, standardized the boxes, okay? Now, that's the second one. The third one is synchronized uh, manufacturing. Now, this is a very interesting one. And we did a project with a company, and we improved the efficiency with a, you know, several hundred percent improvement. Now, for the text box we have been taught for production planning and scheduling, so the objective function is either make span. Make span is the shorter the better. So do the job quickly, as quickly as possible. 
that's the max bound objectives, minimization. Another one is punctuation. Not too early, not too late. At the time we want the product, okay, that's basically what we have been trained for. But in the reality, in the company, no. We don't have to do, to, to do these two. Uh, for that company particularly, uh, we only needed to deliver the order in a given time window. Uh, if it's late, be late altogether. If it's early, be early altogether. But not one in the morning, one in the afternoon. The com company actually we worked with was a painting, painting producer, paints. So if I order one can of black paint and one can of white paint. So black paint is produced in the morning, nine o'clock. Black paint in the afternoon, uh, five o'clock. So the order, the, this order has to wait for uh, from nine o'clock to five o'clock. So six o'clock, you dispatch the order. What we decide help the company to achieve is if you deliver the uh, black paint early in the morning, then make sure the white paint is also produced around 9 o'clock or before 10 o'clock so that we can dispatch the order at 10 o'clock. We don't have to wait. Okay, so we use that objective uh, to optimize. So uh, within one day or within a given time window, this is perfectly acceptable to our customer. But our production efficiency performance can be improved uh, at a very significant percentage, okay, at least 20%, 30%. And then we worked with uh, all the manufacturing companies and uh, some uh, logistics companies, we find synchronization problem is a major problem uh, in industry. It's also a major problem here uh, in our everyday life because say uh, the front row uh, professors we have dinner together at seven o'clock so we go to uh, uh, um, uh, the restaurant say say joseph come be there uh, at seven he can only be there at eight so it's there's no point for us to go there at seven o'clock okay so we all everybody postpone by one hour so that we wait for Joseph to eat together. It was his most, his most important one. We cannot start eating without him. So that's a typical situation you know, in every day and very typical in logistics, manufacturing, and also hospital. Okay, very, very typical problem. Uh, this is how we um, work on the synchronized manufacturing. Uh, I think I already talked about this slide. Uh, you know, tardiness, earliness, not too early, not too fast, uh, makes fun. Uh, this is uh, the, the synchronization problem in the typical factory. Okay. Uh, we actually uh, use the simultaneity as the objective, use punctuality as constraints. But in the past, we use uh, punctuality as objective and simultaneity as uh, soft constraints. Okay, so we turn it outside, turn it around, and we achieved very significant performance improvement. So that's basically the third breakthroughs we have achieved. Now, for this one, actually, it's very interesting. The punctuality and simultaneity can be converted uh, between each other. But I, we have not uh, 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 been able to establish the theoretical model for this. Um, basically, it's like this. So if the order is late by half day, then the, that's late, that's punctuality, OK? We are not punctual. Then the simultaneity in the afternoon to achieve this order, the time window is very small. You have to deliver this order very quickly. Okay, so this uh, relativity of uh, punctuality 
and simultaneity. It's an uh, interesting mechanism. Hopefully, someone can do it. Probably, uh, I may not be able to do it before my retirement. Okay. Uh, we talk about um, uh, several kind of uh, uh, synchronization. We have special temporal synchronization between time windows and space windows. Now, data-driven decision synchronizations and cyber-physical synchronizations, basically, these are the drivers. We use them to achieve these. Okay, uh, this is what we want to achieve. But we use this to collect data, and we uh, use to the, the real-time data in the time window, special temporal window, to do the analytics, and then we arrive at the synchronized decisions. Now the last uh, 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 breakthrough uh, we uh, are very happy with so far. Uh, the name was arbitrary because, as I said, in uh, 2014 I attended the Hong Kong Youth cele Celebration, and I had always had this uh, problem with me. Uh, what's new model for Industry 4.0? Uh, that kept in my mind, and when I saw it, then I said, that's it, this is what we need. Uh, we started working on this. Uh, one PhD, two PhD, end up with a five, six PhD graduate already. Okay. Uh, well, basically, this is a Hong Kong U, typical Hong Kong U, uh, graduation ceremony. So this is a stage. These are graduates and the parents. Okay, parents are upstairs, graduates are here. We have a row there, and those students go to the stage. Stage, a head of a department read out the card, the name of the students, and then the students go to see the president, university president, and then take a photo, and then comes down. So we have three typical operations at the stage, okay. So then we have the queuing, which is uh, basically a uh, scheduling, okay? And admission basically is production planning. So we use the admission ticket as the production. So they are ready to graduate. So ready to graduate is in CPU is ready to be processed. Okay, so ready, production planning, okay? And uh, the a lady will show the department's name, say industrial engineering or computer science or mechanical engineering, show the name, and then those graduates belongs to CS will go to there automatically to queue. That's scheduling. Then we have a queue. And then this head of the department controls the who comes up by reading out the name. If the student is here, uh, Someone is with the president or taking the photo. I will not read that student's name. That's I will control. I'm at you know like a clock. I control the tick. Okay. I only read the student's name when the stage is empty. Okay. That's uh, visible traceability. Visibility. But in factory we do not have this visibility. But we have cyber physical. Visibility. You cannot see them physically, but we can see them logically on the screen. Okay, so the production managers, workers can still execute the production that way. Okay, uh, this is how the, the abstract uh, present of uh, the graduation ceremony. So we have the waiting room and the stage, stage on that side. Okay, these are the three typical tickets. Admission tickets and the program tickets, it's the department's name and also the name tickets. Name tickets is the graduates bring to the head of the department, okay? That's like operation tickets, worksheets, worksheets, the last tickets, okay? And then we use the model for a typical assembly line. Uh, they works extremely well, very, very simple, uh, without sophisticated mathematical model. Simple mathematical model, simple calculation, it works perfectly fine. Uh, it never goes wrong, okay? The reason is, in the uh, graduation ceremony in 
2014, we had students jumping on the stage because we had social events that year. Students, you know, express their political view on the stage uh, during graduation. And I'm happy to say that that session was completely in time, okay? Despite all of those disturbances, there are major disturbances, okay? But everything went fine. So in the factory, it doesn't matter what kind of disturbances we receive, it works, okay? It's very resilient, very robust decision systems. And again, we have a ticketing queuing, and we have synchronization you know, between, between the uh, uh, different queues. It's, that's the synchronization problem I uh, discussed the previous. Okay, so to summarize, what are the significance and the novelty of this uh, factory computer? Basically, at the center, we uh, decompose a complex factory into very simple value creation units. For each unit, we develop a computer, a computer, factory computer, okay? And within each unit, we develop digital twins for all the components, man machine material. So there's a twin for the memory or register of the computer. Then we use that uh, factory operating system for making the planning, scheduling, execution decisions, okay? So we ignore the uncertainty during the small time window slice, okay? But we still consider uh, uncertainty in a longer special temporal window, okay? This is very important because without uncertainty, everything becomes very simple. With uncertainty, everything becomes extremely difficult. Okay, and then we avoided NP hardness in decision model because decision models become very simple, okay, deterministic. And we achieved the resilience and also the robustness for the factory, okay. So uh, the main reason is like a smart uh, uh, factory digitization converges into computer architecture. That's important. We converge into computer architecture all the digitization must create computer memory so that we can use CPU algorithm. Otherwise, we cannot. Okay, that's important. So a physical local round facility, transparencies and uh, uh, traceabilities are extremely important because uh, the CPUs decide what to do next, okay, within each, between each tick, small tick, very fast tick. Um, Operation planning, scheduling, uh, basically because of that, we can uh, incorporate out of order algorithm um, uh, into the decision uh, model. And basically, uh, we have to do data driven spatial temporal synchronization and analytics, okay, to in order to achieve uh, the factory computer. Hopefully, I gave you some overview of a uh, so-called factory computer. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Professor, for your presentation. It's very great, you know. And uh, it's time, you know, for the questions from the audience, please. I'm Atakron from Kim Mongkut University in Thailand. My question is, I believe you know that not long from now, quantum computer will be scaled down, and it will be available for massive scale. So what would be the effect to cyber physical factory if that really happens soon? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that interesting uh, question. And uh, the a simple answer is this factory computer has nothing to do with the quantum computing. However, I have been uh, investigating into quantum uh, uh, entanglement for smart manufacturing because the digital twin basically are quantums and they are entangled, okay, with each other. Uh, but 
after three years of investigation, still no idea, no clue. Because um, uh, in quantum mechanics, you have statistics or stochastics. Um, but in smart manufacturing, that's completely different. Uh, I did spend a lot of time investigating into uh, manufacturing entanglement. I hope to write a paper on manufacturing entanglement. But so far, I cannot. It's too difficult for me. But I know these twins are entangled. I don't know how they are entangled. Uh, what's the science behind it? Okay, I'm sorry, I cannot. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. But it's worth investigating, though. Thank you for the question. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Professor Huang, uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, my name is Min Chuan Chiu from National Chinese University in Taiwan. I have a quick question about. Uh, you just mentioned about digital inventory, but in uh, as I know, digital inventory should be equal to physical inventory. But in your presentation, you think uh, digital inventory can be somehow uh, be part of physical uh, view as physical inventory. I, I don't know if I understand right. No, I did not say digital inventory can be treated as uh, uh, physical inventory. I didn't say that, but I did say. Digital inventory can be treated as inventory because they are promised to be delivered at the time and the location you need them, so they are inventory. Okay. Thank you for your great uh, keynote speak and with very interesting examples. As a PhD student, I'm looking forward to the graduation ceremony. Uh, regarding the granularity of the digitalization, um, you've mentioned that we only need to uh, digitalize the parts that generate value. Uh, my question is uh, how to define the value creation. For example, uh, we have the transition belts in the pro on the production line. Uh, usually, uh, it's very stable and it does not uh, directly add, add, uh, add on values to the products. But when the belt shut down, uh, there are great costs. So, uh, okay, I'll give you one example, which yeah. is not value creating unit. Uh, 10 years ago, many companies asked us to develop, uh, install RFID devices with the door of a factory. Okay, I told them, don't do it. Okay, because it creates no value for your production. Okay, it does contribute value for logistics materials. Okay, but does not contribute to production value. Now don't do it because it it costs money. Okay, but if you really want to control the flow of material, that's logistics, intra logistics. That's a separate thing. Okay, but don't include it as part of smart manufacturing or you know production planning scheduling component. Okay, so with the industrial engineering, it's, uh, we have methods to identify the value creation unit. Um, there are some methods. I think a lot, yesterday I saw some presentation with a MIT uh, very famous structure matrix. So you can s simply use that structure matrix to you know, create the, 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 the unit uh, in a diagonal. Uh, they are value creation unit. All the other sporadic uh, units, don't, you don't need to care about those, only those in the diag diagonal line. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, any more questions? Okay, uh, my question is, uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, the innovation that you develop in here is very really interesting, especially for for the large companies. Uh, what is your recommendation? You know, if uh, they want to adopt uh, the innovations or the methods that you develop, you know, uh, for the SME, because you know uh, they have a lot of limitations. You know, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, what we should. It's very difficult to persuade anyone so far on the stage or even at meetings at a short distance because things are too new to practitioners. Uh, what we are trying to do is to develop what you see is what you get. Uh, laboratory demos 
in the university. So uh, with this ground, our team here and there will develop uh, what you see is what you get demo. So that uh, we organize workshops, uh, site visit in our lab, so the practitioners can pick up what they want. Okay, I did try to persuade some of them, but um, very difficult because uh, completely different, different from uh, the mindset all, of all the engineers trained traditionally. Okay, it doesn't matter how I say this is very simple, never goes wrong, and they don't trust me. Okay, uh, so I needed to uh, demonstrate in the lab, and we are pretty confident we should be able to do it. We did once for logistics, and we got uh, two or three companies sign contract with us. So we will do it for factory. Hopefully, a few companies will sign contract with us. Yeah. All right. Don't have to be big companies. Yeah. It can be small companies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. What? One more question. You know, <clears throat> actually, you know, um, the cyber physics that uh, you have done, you know, kind of integrated with uh, somehow uh, optimization, right? And uh, if, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, if I want to, to apply, you know, the cyber physics, you know, for agricultural sector, I, I believe that, you know, the, the improvement, you know, can help, you know, the, the farmer, the growers, or even the, the industry, you know, to improve, you know, their performance somehow. So, so how, how can we, you know, apply the cyber physics, you know, in agricultural sector, and what are the limitations? Yeah, certainly uh, we can. Uh, we did spend some time with the, in our culture, but later on we focus in uh, the where I can get grants. Okay, so now all my focus uh, are on production and logistics and construction, not agriculture. But agriculture, you create uh, digital twins for man machine material and also the fields. One of my students actually uh, works in that area. Uh, he graduated already, uh, did that, and then he applied some of the algorithms for uh, planning the uh, agricultural machineries, the field, the trucks, harv harvesters. Okay, we basically create digital twins for those, and then apply the cyber physical algorithms uh, for the application. It's uh, Basically the same. Basically the same. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. We we come to the end of the session. Give him the big hands. Thank you. Thank you very much.